All right, so uh, good afternoon. I'm Matt Coos. I'm founder and CEO of Cumulos, a longtime Splunk partner. Uh, I'm here with Anthony Perez, who's the director of uh, field, uh, public sector field technology at Splunk. And we're very excited to be here today uh, talking to you this afternoon. Um, Anthony, you want to give a background on yourself? Yeah, absolutely. A so uh, thank you all for coming to the session. We appreciate it, especially after a long first day. As uh, Matt mentioned, I'm Director of Field Technology for Splunk's public sector business. I wear a lot of hats, uh, but been around Splunk as a Splunk employee for about five years, and I was a Splunk customer for roughly three years prior to that, uh, primarily supporting DoD and intelligence community around general cybersecurity concepts and then uh, uh, more technical analyses. And back to Matt. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, my background very quickly is uh, I was an executive at DHS, uh, Homeland Security, for a couple years. And I had the mission of helping the executive uh, branch of government improve their cyber posture. So a uh, very small scope gig, very easy, simple thing to do. Um, actually, it was a pretty tough gig, um, but a really valuable gig, right? So um, I think the best thing about that job was I got to work with probably some of the best brains in the business. Um, I worked with folks from NSA uh, on the ground there doing really tough work uh, on a daily basis with NIST, um, uh, a variety of CISOs. I had uh, advisors from the private sector um, and some big commercial companies that do, do cyber defense. Um, so I learned a lot in that job, and it's really informed kind of my thinking uh, with respect to, to compliance and risk management. Um, one of the biggest things I learned from that experience was um, what cyber is all about, right? what cyber and risk management is really all about. And to me, it's ultimately about managing change, looking at change, monitoring change, visualizing change, uh, and ultimately acting on that to minimize your risk, right? And it's something that we don't do very well in general, and so that's kind of what we want to talk to you about today. Um, the uh, other experience I had was working with US CERT. So uh, that was my sister organization back in the day. Um, we would go, uh, we visited a lot of companies that had major breaches and got to learn from that. You would recognize some of them if I was able to, to say who they were. Um, and we learned a lot about defensive you know, cyber capabilities and what really people needed to implement across um, those different organizations. Um, so it's, it's definitely been an informative uh, experience in the past. Um, the analogy I just wanted to throw out there at the start is um, I, used to, I used to be an Army pilot, so I, I flew helicopters for a couple years, and I really um, have started to equate uh, cyber defense and risk management to kind of being a pilot with a fully equipped cockpit, right? Um, I don't think you can do cyber defense or you know, risk management in cyber without that capability, right? So that's kind of the analogy I'm going to use today. Um, and ultimately, what I'm hoping to leave you with today is, like, have you guys hungry to go get your pilot's license, right? Your cyber pilot license um, to instrument those cockpits out there across your organizations and mature your capabilities. Um, the sad thing is that legacy GRC doesn't really do that for you, right? And so we're going to talk about that some of the challenges around that uh, of the past, how we can solve some of that, uh, and hopefully get you on, on the path to, to mature um, capability for, for your cyber defense. Um, so with that, does that sound good? Yeah. You wanna do that? All right, <laughs> All right. so we'll keep going then. Um, this is the, the legal thing we've gotta put up, forward-looking statements, uh, hopefully we won't make any of those, but uh, if we do, we're, we're covered because we showed you the slide. Um, please read that very quickly, uh, I'll move on. All right, so one size does not fit all. So we want to start with like a discussion of the requirements, right? So what is it that your instrument panel, your cockpit needs to consist of, right? What are those different instruments you need to do cyber defense well? Turns out that, that they're fairly consistent. Um, wh whatever your kind of framework you're following, if it's NIST, if it's HIPAA, if it's PCI, GDPR, all those have different security and privacy controls, and they're very much the same, right? They're, there's mappings across all those things. Ultimately, it's a bunch of controls you need to put in place and, and kind of monitor those changes and, and act on those changes. So luckily, that tends to be fairly similar, right? You can kind of relate one AC control to a, another regardless of framework, and that's, that's a, good, a good thing. Um, where we start to lose that consistency is um, how organizations have implemented those controls, right? There's a lot of variability and maturity out there, even today, and it's kind of insane because this has been a problem for like 20 plus years. Um, so we came up with this really simple uh, maturity curve model. Um, it's going to blow you away, right? So crawl, that's stage one. Um, that's basically, you know, people are doing legacy compliance, right? They're doing manual evidence collection. They're paying a lot of money, typically, for people to run around and grab static information, bring it back, show auditors, you know, that they're super secure. Um, and that's kind of what we're calling the crawl phase of maturity, right? Not a lot of security value in that. 
Um, and so we, we don't think that's a great place to be on the maturity curve, but some organizations may want to be there. Um, the next phase is really the walk phase. And so that's where you're getting into a little bit more technical evidence capturing, hopefully in real time. Uh, but typically what we see here is there's just a, a, a subset of the instrument panel that you need, right? So typically I see people are doing volume scans and they're collecting that information, maybe in real time, maybe every couple of weeks. Um, so they've got kind of part of that cockpit out, but it's pretty sporadic and it definitely can't let you fly. Um, then there's the run, run stage, right? So running um, in the maturity curve means you are monitoring all those great technical controls that NIST and others have gone to the trouble of defining um, that definitely can inform your security posture. Um, you're pulling in the different data sources across your environment uh, to inform those controls and build out that, that cockpit and that um, instrument panel. Uh, and automating activities, right? You're automating, you know, assessment of controls, maybe actions you can take dynamically based on real data. So that's run. Um, in my experience, if you're at the run phase uh, or stage, you are, have a very, very solid security posture. It's not just about compliance. It's, it's compliance driving robust security posture, and ultimately that's what you can get to. Um, so I'd like to do just a, I do a couple of these talks a year, and I definitely appreciate the feedback from the audience. Um, so I kind of like want to do a quick uh, poll. Um, given those definitions and kind of what we think about the maturity curves, how many of you would consider your orgs in like the crawl phase? Crawl stage of maturity, okay. So you're flying that little Cessna and you're kind of sticking your finger out the window, seeing how fast you're going, and that's basically the only instrument you got, right? All right, that's cool. Um, how about walk? Who are you, or how many are walking and pulling in some data, maybe not holistically, maybe not mapping it to systems, but at least you're getting some technical. I, I expected that because we're in a, a Splunk audience and that's great to see. I think you guys are leading the charge with kind of improving this, this maturity level and, and getting your uh, organizations uh, you know, flying. Um, and then how many are run? Like, I'm really curious about this. Wow, that's awesome, okay, wow. Cool, so a couple of you guys are doing like broad data source collection, aggregation, real time, and then contextualizing it into systems and giving it to the relevant owners. Is that, that right? Cool, all right, I wanna hire you guys after the, call, after, <laughs> after the talk. Um, so that's good, so there's a couple in, in that bucket, but not very many. Um, so the good news is that there's, there's room for improvement across, I think, uh, everyone in the room, and, and really, by and large, more broadly, uh, the population uh, of the US and, and beyond. Um, and so that's kind of where we wanna hopefully get you uh, today. Um, so, we're going to get you that pilot license. Um, we're going to start with, uh, Anthony's going to cover a few of the um, challenges that we've seen um, in the past, so you can kind of get a baseline of what, what the issues are that you need to solve to drive up that maturity curve, okay? So we're going to scare you a little bit with this next stuff. I'm going to skip these. All right, Anthony. Cool, thanks so much. So just a, a quick comment. <clears throat> can you hear me? Excellent, thank you. Uh, so quick comment on this curve. So same data represented graphically. Where you want to be is within the, the dashed box up in the, uh, the corner here. And so getting somewhere higher up this curve is the current intent. So as, as Matt mentioned, the, the, the somewhat uh, challenging legacy around GRC, we could probably all uh, answer the question in the room on, on what the challenges are or why we've been so, it's been such a struggle historically, but we'd probably all give some somewhat different answers. So take this with a, a large grain of salt. We've tried to coalesce down into a manageable uh, set of categories of why GRC has not been able to fulfill this actual desired outcome of being on the upper right of that maturity curve. So scope and scale is one of the first ones we've co coalesced down around. Think of this as things like um, uh, large complex agencies and sub-agencies and teams within those organizations, uh, geographic, uh, different geographic locations or, or geographic diversity associated with the systems that would be necessary to provide a holistic point of visibility into overall compliance security posture, uh, volume and variety of data, and uh, frankly, the, the old tech, the legacy GRC tech, uh, in many cases just struggles to keep up with any one of these variables, let alone the complexity of compounding these variables together to try and gain some kind of um, uh, appreciation or visibility around uh, scope and scale. So on the visibility side, as I mentioned just a moment ago, visualization of that data, for the reasons I mentioned on scope and scale, as well as the outdated tech and the, the ability to transport data from A to B. These slides, by the way, will all be available after conf, so don't feel like you have to take uh, too many vigorous notes. We'll share the deck with you. Um, by the time that the data gets into the system, if it ever actually gets into the system, it's outdated, so you cannot truly make data-driven data -driven decisions on that data because it's by nature outdated and making a, an ill-informed or uh, at least late-informed uh, decision. So it's unclear what the actual security policy 
for the organization at any given time is a function of that. So lack of visibility is really what that slide is intending to say. Diversity, beyond the geographic uh, locations and uh, organizational complexity that I mentioned earlier, different vendors, different systems comprised of different components also add complexity. Uh, and then you think of multiple sub-agencies with different systems and different vendors and different uh, ecosystems, normalizing that data in a way that aligns with the security controls for FISMA or DFARS or RMF or GDPR or whatever the framework may be, it's a really big challenge to try to have some normalization layer, some abstraction that lets you truly understand what the security posture is with respect to whatever controls framework are applicable to the organization. That kind of feeds back into the visibility challenges I mentioned earlier. So retroactive, this is uh, similar in the, the data transport uh, consideration I mentioned earlier. Uh, that latency and getting data from A to B across different systems, across different networks, across different geolocations, uh, introduces what we've termed as uh, analytic lag for this presentation. And the, the uh, analytic lag means that ISOs or senior decision makers don't truly understand their security posture, which is frankly the intent of having these compliance frameworks in the first place. It's real computer network defense, real visibility into security posture. And they cannot do that. And there is no continuous monitoring if the data is never current at any given time to help make decisions around that data. So the retroactivity is a, a consistent challenge, and rigidity. Um, I, I, someone who worked as a consultant for uh, six, seven years uh, for U.S. federal and, and uh, DoD organizations, I, I, I can say, uh, and I'll beat up on myself a little bit here and say that um, there are federal systems integrators that do really good jobs and they try to do the right thing, but fundamentally the business model in a lot of cases is ongoing services or ongoing engagement. So if you're in that business, that's fantastic for business, but if you're in the business of fulfilling national security or computer network defense for the United States of America and its citizens, uh, it's extremely costly and inefficient and time consuming to have to keep up with a legacy GRC system that constantly requires multiple people putting hands on the system and modifying the system and extending that system every time you need a tiny little tweak or to add a new data source or to look at the same data that you already have but look at, look at it in a different way. And when you inject that maintenance and O&M cost of extension and just keeping the system online and consider that, um, back to the visibility challenge yet again, uh, if it takes six months to do that tweak or get that new data in or change that lens that you're putting on the data you already had, six months is a lifetime. If you're an offensive operator and you're trying to gain access to a system or you're trying to find a new way in, a six month window or a six week window or even six day window for a sophisticated adversary is a lifetime to get in establish persistence, locate whatever you're interested in, and start exfilling that data. That's a, a large block of time. So to think that we could do any sort of real continuous monitoring in this legacy function where we have this long gap to extend and modify and maintain these systems is just, frankly, a non-starter. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, a couple head nods there. So uh, I'm gonna pass it back to Matt to talk a little bit about saying goodbye to all the challenges that we just articulated. All right. So hopefully you all are sufficiently depressed and we can't overcome all those giant challenges, right? <laughs> uh, no, so there's good news. We have some solutions for you that we'd like to share um, to help you kind of climb that maturity curve. Um, if you were doing compliance 10 years ago, these challenges were real. Like there was no way to get around these things. Like doing real-time ingest from multiple sources with the variability, dynamically mapping to controls and to systems and system boundaries, impossible, right? Um, so I don't blame GRC tools for kind of what they were and what they did, but it's definitely time to change all that, right? So um, just want to share you, with you kind of a, a notional roadmap um, solution-based to show you that we have solved these challenges um, and, and how we can help you get, get through this maturity curve. So um, first of all, like every phase of the solution here re requires Splunk Enterprise. So that's a, kind of our underlying requirement. Um, we have an app called Q Compliance that can help you get to crawl, right? So if you remember, crawl is about legacy GRC. Um, this solution allows you to upload those static evidence, documents, files, policies, capture human activity, map your controls, your overlays, inherit controls, do all that legacy stuff, right? That has nothing to do with real-time machine data. Um, you can do this cheaply. So if you guys are, for the folks that said they're at crawl, I don't know if you're spending a lot of money on a GRC solution, many of you are, many, like million or more, um, and not to, not to mention the resources to support that. You can get this thing in place for very cheaply. You buy a small Splunk license, a small key compliance license, and you can kind of do a lot of that GRC stuff then and there, right? So that's kind of step one. Um, to get the walk, there's some options, and we're gonna show you some of these demos real quick, or in a minute, but 
um, to walk. Uh, it, it's, again, it's about a subset of technical controls that you want to monitor. And so you have your options, right? Depending on your data sources that you have available, uh, you may want to go with Splunk Compliance Analytics. That's an app that Splunk built, Anthony's team uh, put out there, and that gives you insight into, into certain technical controls. Um, Q Audit is another uh, application that we built that gives you a deep dive into your audit controls. So we're taking all those audit logs and contextualizing them for you. And so if you want to build out that portion of your instrument panel in the cockpit with your audit controls and monitoring those in real time, Q Audit's a good option for you. Q Compliance is kind of, again, the full-blown the full um, solution. So you can do all your technical controls, custom controls, and so forth. Uh, and then finally, to get to run, it's really Q Compliance is the, is the only solution. That's all the controls you want to uh, implement, multiple frameworks, inheritance, all that good, happy stuff um, with some pre-built alerts um, for real-time continuous monitoring. So there is hope. Uh, we've solved these challenges. Um, there's multiple options for you. You can build it. You can use some of these. Uh, but the goal is let's get everybody to run, do compliance the way it should be done, and adding real security value um, to the mix. All right, so with that, I'm going to um, pass it over to Anthony and, and talk through those obstacles again and how these solutions actually solve those things. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Thanks. So uh, <clears throat> is anyone here not a Splunk user already? So prepare to be wowed by uh, some obvious statements from in this case, since every, everyone in here is already a, a Splunk user. Uh, but on the scope and scale side, so the ability to natively tag data, um, uh, do lookups or, or graphical layout or um, uh, key store mappings of what components of infrastructure map back to uh, a system or an ATO, uh, hybrid architecture, distributed architecture, cloud on-prem, or any, uh, any of the above, um, and to do so at scale uh, beyond what a legacy GRC, even on paper, ever said that they could do at scale. Um, it seems obvious to a Splunker, uh, but to folks that are not familiar with Splunk and not familiar with how Splunk handles these challenges in general, let alone when applied to uh, uh, compliance and continuous monitoring, uh, this is revolutionary. So the, the takeaway there is that just core Splunk as a fundamental system enables a lot of, of uh, removes, I should say, a lot of the overall obstacles here. Visibility, so holistic visibility of even very large data sets uh, is a natural, uh, Splunk can do that and eat that every day. Uh, a lot of variety of, uh, of visualizations, and I understand that we'll be announcing new visualization framework this week while we're out at comp, so excited about that. And it's only getting better uh, on the visibility side or visualization side as far as uh, Splunk as the underlying platform uh, for this use case. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the diversity was a challenge. I'll say that Splunk through common information models, uh, the, the uh, common information model app or custom data models or data normalization is very easy out of the box to normalize that data. So the challenge of this different vendors, different data, different source types, uh, connecting that back to the cybersecurity frameworks, uh, FISMA, DFARS, RMF, et cetera, um, it's all really easy. It's just natural and baked into Splunk and easy to surface that data in a way that's normalized that gives senior decision makers visibility of posture, uh, whereas previously that was an unattainable unattainable goal. Uh, so the analytic lag or the system slowness that I mentioned, uh, the, the, the look back versus having near real-time visibility. Uh, Splunk's near real-time architecture, when built at scale, uh, can provide that near real-time visibility and confidence that decisions or defensive actions or defensive posture alerting that takes place within Splunk uh, is actually real and justifiable. And you know that you're making the right decisions and you have confidence in the decisions that you're making based on that data. Uh, and as an exact, I don't know, you know, for, for any um, senior folks in the room, uh, it, it, nothing would scare me more than making a decision that could, like pulling the proverbial plug out of the wall to disconnect a system uh, because I had bad data and I, I, I knocked some critical system offline because I felt that there was some emergency situation or vice versa. Nothing would scare me more than the ability to uh, say, oh, well, my light is green on my dashboard and I think uh, everything's okay from a security posture perspective. And in reality, my data is just outdated and I'm making a bad decision on it. So having Splunk's real-time architecture gets rid of that retroactive uh, consideration from the past. Talk about data source abstraction already. Um, vendor agnostic nature is a key function. Like if you're all Splunkers, you already get the ability to have visualizations regardless of the underlying infrastructure. And then flexibility. Um, we, we, uh, got our, uh, uh, we are fed ramped. Uh, at the moderate level now, so I can say with confidence and pride uh, for Splunk that we're now able to furnish a Splunk cloud service offering at the FedRAMP moderate level. So organizations out there that have a cloud for a strategy that want to move workloads into the cloud for continuous monitoring or defensive security operations, you're now able to do that in a FedRAMP environment uh, or on-prem or hybrid. 
Uh, okay. So that's, uh, that's the kind of look back on how Splunk is addressing the, um, the historical challenges. So let's talk a little bit about how to get there, how to make the giant leaps forward. And as, as Matt mentioned earlier, um, we'll talk about three specific pieces of tech today, and the fun is in the demos anyway. So we'll demonstrate what these look like, but quickly. Um, the Splunk Compliance Analytics Solution, part of my organization is a small rapid prototyping development shop that saw a need to build out a functional capability that got organizations from the crawl or less than crawl or close to zero stage and move them up the maturity curve. So we built the Splunk Compliance Analytics Solution not as the be all end all world beater, but as a vehicle to get folks from extremely low on the curve to higher up the curve with a really light level of effort. Uh, so it's a way to jump up, provides that quick start, Baseline technical controls, so not the people, not the process, but just the technical controls in 853 draft rev 5, uh, DOD, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, DOD RMF, which points back to 853, and then 853, or sorry, 8171 on the DFAR side for federal systems integrators or DOD contractors. So easily scalable, handles the technical controls. Um, we built an 80% solution knowing that every organization has a 20% delta or 75% solution. Every organization has 25% delta for customization or specific things that they need that may not built, be built into that uh, fundamental framework. Um, but you may require more out of the box and that's, uh, well Matt will be showing that kind of really sophisticated demos that they built out in the past. Okay, you guys wanna see it? Yeah, yeah? okay, we'll take that, we'll take that. Let me see if I can push the right button here. The demo system, that was painless. <laughs> okay, so you'll see the, uh, the FISMA banner here. There's a config screen just like any other Splunk app. There's a setup menu that lets you select FISMA or DFARS or RMF. Uh, in this particular case, we're in FISMA because that's the one that uh, when I logged in was, was present. Um, a, a data point for some organizations that may be here, if you have uh, like a federal systems integrator that has an RMF context or they may need a FISMA context, they have a DFARS context for their internal networks, but they're providing services to a customer that may have RMF applicability or FISMA applicability. It's really easy to just use the setup menu and config and oscillate between the two or three, depending on the context. It just drops a new default.xml file to reskin the UI because the underlying data sources fundamentally are driving the same frameworks. It's just couched in different language and different criteria. So when you log in, you're greeted with this splash screen. You'll notice that at the top of the screen, A. Perez was you know, most recently logged in 14 minutes ago. That was me when I, I logged in the system here. But this provides an immediate page-by-page -page visibility for who's looking at what page and how long ago they were. The point of that's like a, a, a piece of accountability. So I know if I'm an SO, I've got to look at these pages for these systems. Uh, or if I have direct reports, my direct report should be going into the system and looking at the data on some regular frequency. The technical controls families are built out here. I actually prefer the uh, controls overview dash, which I'll pop open for you here, uh, because there are cases where you may not want to see all of the underlying controls. So if you click into this dashboard, it'll show you the technical controls that are built out. But for the sake of demonstration today, I'll deselect all and just pick a couple uh, here on management, seven, config management maybe, and let's say system integrity. So a handful here. So you wanna go in and see uh, from a compliance perspective, um, who's making changes in my environment. And we sprinkled in some MLT, some machine learning toolkit into this app as well. So anywhere you see the term automated, we're using either quantitative or categorical uh, algorithms to depict what normal should be and what is expected to be normal based on historical data and then plotting outliers so an analyst can say, well, the changes that normally take place in this network uh, are within this band. However, these three in this particular case in our dummy demo data system are anomalous with what we would expect from a change detection perspective. So automated indications of what's normal versus what's not normal. Changes what's most common uh, system changes in the environment or the least common system changes in the environment. Uh, I'll flag there for you. I'll skip in the interest of time this unsuccessful login. So local, show me what uh, local logins look like, show me what remote logins look like, GOIP lookup, that sort of fundamental stuff. Do I have uh, folks trying to log into my system from Southeast Asia? regular basis, maybe that's normal, maybe that's not normal, but it provides a quick visual indicator to pop that in front of an analyst eyeball so that they can actually dig in and look at the data. Um, let's say user installed software. Uh, anybody have uh, users that just install random stuff, make really bad decisions about installing software in the premise? No. Oh, you admitted to it, two of you, oh. Yeah, it, it, it happens, it, it absolutely happens. Well, the idea, the concept for this user installed software is Maybe, maybe your environment is so locked down that um, the general Joe and Jane user can't just go in and install a bunch of software in their environment. Uh, 
Uh, but the goal is you know what a, what a Linux server should look like, you know what a Windows server should look like, you know what a desktop workstation should look like uh, from a gold master image perspective. Uh, so it's really, easily to, it's really easy to log in and go look at those systems and say, well, what is my delta on these Windows servers or these desktops and know if you've got an executive server or maybe a critical system that's got um, Netcat running on it, maybe that's legit if it's an admin's box, uh, but maybe it's not if it's an executive's, um, like the CIO's uh, personal device is running Netcat and then forwarding traffic uh, to uh, an IP that uh, corresponds to a, an Oconus uh, geolocation, for example. Does that make sense? Yeah, cool. Yeah. Right. A row four. No, no. This is mapped to draft row five. I mentioned draft uh, earlier, and uh, we'll take questions at the end. But I'll say, since we're on the topic briefly, we mapped to row five because we didn't want when row five went live to have this big delta. I'll say frankly, and, and just among friends here, most of the delta that I've observed in row five and our dev team's analysis on row five is more around privacy protections, GDPR flavored stuff. Uh, so we feel really confident that the mappings that were done not only correlate to the active Rev4, uh, but touch on any draft changes in late stage Rev5. It's a, it's a great question, though. All right, and last but not least, and I'll get off the podium here and hand it back to Matt, um, we'll say SI3 on the malware protection side. Jump over to this other tab. And effectively, this just gives high-level stats on how well or how poorly an environment is doing with respect to host-based uh, anti-malware. Uh, so how many boxes in my environment have an infection? And um, for, as an engineer, it frustrates me that my dummy demo data has the same value here. The, the, it's fake data, right, obviously, so grant me a little bit of latitude, but uh, 197 boxes have at least one, so greater, th greater than zero, and then greater than one is the panel on the right. So how many boxes in my environment have multiple infections? How is that indicative of an outbreak, for example? Uh, what variants are being seen in the environment over the look-back window that we're the dashboard's configured for, and then what is my host base uh, anti-malware doing with respect to that? Is it quarantining it, is it deleting it, is it deferring? Um, and then a SAN key, and the point of the SAN key is often confusing for folks, so what I'll say here is, I don't really care if user one is shopping on Amazon on their lunch break, or streaming, streaming a video, if Final Four is going on. What I do care about is um, calls home to uh, rare uh, domains or something that's got like a 30 character second level domain that's clearly gener generated by a DGA and a domain uh, generating algorithm to call home to a command and control server or to push traffic out to an intermediate node so the, you know, the, the bad guys that are already in my environment are just pushing traffic out uh, and it's slipping under the wire. So this re really practically speaking just provides a quick visual indicator to show uh, what's normal and what's abnormal in an environment and uh, the ability to pivot on that really quickly and skinny down into what other boxes in my environment in this hypothetical example are pushing traffic to that same C2 node or that same really, really unusual domain. Does that make sense? Cool, okay. All right, I think that's all I wanted to show today. So again, that's SCA, and uh, as, as Matt mentioned in the graphic, that's um, you know, between walk and run, but nowhere near some of the really impressive, sophisticated stuff that Matt's about to show you here as we get into uh, to QAudit. Back to you. Right, thanks, Anthony. Yep. All right, so um, our solution uh, that can help you walk is QAudit. Um, depending on, again, what data sources you have in your environment, what, uh, what controls you want to automate, um, think of QAudit as a deep dive into your audit controls, so your AU controls, right? Multiple frameworks have these defined. Um, typically, it's around um, you know, audit logs and, and monitoring uh, a full set of audit logs. So what we've done is we've taken an uh, intelligence community standard called 500-27. <laughs> it's mandatory for classified networks. And it's basically a prescriptive audit policy that defines a whole long list of things that you have to monitor. It's mandatory for all classified networks in the US government. Um, and we just took that as a gold standard audit policy, let our customers adopt that, and then give them an app to monitor it right out of the box. So the value of that is that um, you can quickly build that instrument panel. All your audit controls can be monitored. Um, you can alert, alert changes, uh, drive alert actions. Um, the hard part, I think, is mapping all those event codes into the different um, families of events, and we've taken care of all that for you. Um, so really what you get out of the box is kind of a, an ability to walk with respect to monitoring audit controls. Um, we tell you what you, can, what you should be logging, um, how to monitor and alert on those, and ultimately, you know, you're kind of meeting the intent of compliance uh, for the audit controls. You're actually getting security value out of that, right? So you're actually seeing what your users are doing on your, on your networks, what, uh, what your devices activity, uh, what activity exists for your devices, and you can take action for that. 
So I will jump over to demo and show you a quick couple of screenshots for QAudit. So um, again, this is a kind of a deep dive into audit controls. Um, the, oops. The ICS standard I mentioned, again, mandatory. It's just a great uh, audit policy to adopt. That on the right there shows you the list of, of monitorable events. Um, so basically, if you have a, a, an IG or a regulatory body that comes around and dings you for your audit policy, this is a pretty defensible thing to adopt. The ISD you know, built it with MITRE's help, um, and it's mandatory out there. Um, then you've got a data summary page. So this dashboard gives you kind of that metadata view. Uh, of your auditable sources, right? So making sure all those sources are still publishing. You haven't dropped any data sources from coming into Splunk. Um, gives you, you know, recent trends in, in logging those. It gives you trends across the families. Gives you all the events uh, per source as well. Uh, and then ultimately all the individual events uh, collected on a daily basis. So that's kind of the start of it. There's a real-time monitoring dashboard as well. So you can see all the individual events across all the families in the standard. And then the bulk of the app is, are these event families, right? So we broke down all the, all the audit policies into these different families. And if I click on one, you'll see individual, you know, kind of uh, individual instruments, if you will. This is your dashboard. This is your, this is your cockpit for authentication events, right? So you've got all that pre-built. Um, you can view uh, the different activities. These are all Splunk queries. And so you can alert on any of these just like you would any Splunk query. Um, and, and drive uh, alert actions from that. Um, we do incorporate some machine learning uh, from Splunk into it as well to detect certain anomalies. And we've got these uh, throughout uh, different places in the app, uh, depending on the family. And then once you, once you view that and you detect maybe a certain user or maybe a certain device that has an anomalous event detected, you can then go over to the user host investigation dashboard and use it as kind of like the, the early stage insider threat you know, investigation. So you can, the standard actually came out of the insider threat uh, executive order. Um, and so that's kind of the, one of the kind of three parts of an insider threat program is this capability to do an initial inquiry. And you can basically come in, sort by user, sort by device, uh, and actually see what that activity looks like across all categories of events for that particular user or device. So um, you can also drill in, uh, view individual uh, details, uh, log events, and just like Splunk, you can drill into the details and find you know, specific hosts and so forth. So that's QAudit, gets you walking, gets you monitoring some audit controls, which hopefully are valuable, um, and gives you actually the security value around the intent of those controls that, that compliance uh, frameworks have defined. All right. I'm now going to jump over to Q compliance. All right, so this is kind of the top of the maturity curve, right? This is our solution for getting you to run or fly, if you want to call it that. Um, please take a look at the key features in the box there. That's a lot of your typical GRC stuff. Um, so defining organizational hierarchies, defining uh, FISMA boundaries or, or system boundaries is important to do. And then contextualizing all that machine data into those different buckets is what we take care of in Q compliance. Um, not to mention the, the fully built out control sets and inheritance and, and all the you know, standard bells and whistles that your GRC probably has. Um, so you get, you get the, not only the kind of the run capabilities, but you actually get the build, ability to crawl initially with GRC stuff. You can deploy a 10 gig license of Splunk and this and have a lot of what your GRC does right there out of the box. Um, upload manual evidence, track human activity records. And then as you want to sort of get to walk, you can maybe pop in some data into Splunk, grow, the, grow a little bit, get some controls populated. And if you want to get to run, pop in more data, get all those controls automated. So you're really monitoring your technical controls across the board. Um, we have a user interface as well, so it'll walk you through RMF, if you're familiar with that. Is everybody here federal, or is there commercial as well? Any commercial? Do you follow RMF, NIST, or just your own? OK. So. Okay, yeah, so it's pretty generic, but just walking through, you know, here's my org, here's my system boundary, here's the high, what controls I want to apply. What's that? Yeah, the system boundary, actually, yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. So walking through that is, you know, it's a UI thing, so you can do that here. Um, and then we've got the dashboards, the workflows, you can do tickets, um, you can do POAMs, which are plans of action and milestones. So <laughs> everyone's got gaps in controls and their effectiveness or maybe how they've implemented those. And so a POAM is just kind of a, crazy government, government acronym for a project plan to fix 
your gaps, right? So we track, like, if you have a gap in a certain control, maybe you're not implementing it or it's not effective, you can define a, a plan to get that fixed and monitor it in the app. So that's, that's helpful for a lot of people. Um, and ultimately, it's about, like, getting to ongoing assessment, right? Automated assessment of controls, maybe ongoing authorization if you are federal, uh, authorizing systems in an ongoing way with real machine data driving that. And then really the, the gold sort of you know, dream of everyone is CONMON, right? So continuous monitoring of all your technical controls, regardless of source, and that's really what we, what we deliver here. So that's kind of Q um, compliance. So let me show you that one. This is normally a hour demo, so I'm gonna go very quickly and <laughs> show you just a couple of my favorite screenshots um, or you know, parts of the app. Um, so this is Q compliance. <clears throat> um, there's views for executives over here. There's views for ISOs or system owners, uh, whoever is managing collections of controls. Uh, there's views for that. Um, there are detailed control views. So every control and enhancement in NIST 853 is here, that's where all the evidence lives. So you have one pane of glass to collect all your evidence, whether it's static GRC type stuff, policies, documents, files, or it's real time machine driven technical evidence that you're getting dynamically, it's all in, in one spot. And then there's a configuration section where you actually set up the app. This is built for a U, like an ISO, uh, you know, an actual IA professional to use. You don't have to be a hardcore spunker. You need a hardcore spunker to help you get the data in, but once you do that, you're good to go. Um, and you can actually set up your, your apps, define your ODPs, all the good stuff we're all familiar with uh, being um, IA folks. Um, so I'll jump in to, like, let's say the second level view, so maybe a system overview. For your CISO or executives in the room, um, you might wanna come here, give me a big picture. What, how am I doing across all my controls that, I, that live under this organization and all the systems that are under that organization? These are just scores rolled up for which controls are passing and failing and, and how many have been reviewed. There's trends of that data as well. Um, below that is a comparison by all my systems that live in this organization. So think of a system as a group of assets, however you want to define it. Very flexible to define that however you want um, and apply controls to those collections of assets. And so here I'm seeing the percentages of the controls that, have, that apply to those systems are passing, failing, or haven't been assessed. Um, and then down below is more of a by family of controls um, scores. So if I have, you know, really families of controls that are failing, maybe I'm just not, if my AU family is failing, I've got, uh, sorry, it's down here. Um, I've got maybe a problem getting my audit logs in, or maybe I'm not, I'm not deploying my audit policies across the, the assets I need. So it's a very quick executive level view. Where do I put resources? What technologies do I invest in? Let's get that going um, and move on. From there, I can drill into to whatever way I want. I'll, I'll jump to a particular system from here. And we're just going down to the next level, right? So this is that kind of start of the ISO view. So this is all the families of controls for which I've tailored controls into the system and their scores. So their assessment scores uh, and um, the percentage that have been reviewed. So I may want to kind of drive some activity there. Um, I can then drill into a particular family of controls if I want. And I can see the individual controls and enhancements that have applied or tailored in and their audit and assessment scores and maybe take some action there. And then finally, I can drill into the, the individual control level view. And this is where the fantastic colors come out and show you the real kind of Kanban capability. So for this particular system in this particular organization, I've got a bunch of controls and enhancements applied. Uh, the gray just means I've tailored those out. Uh, I can see their audit status, assessment status. I can see the history here. I can add new things. I can see what NIST or whatever framework you're using, custom controls. I can see the language of that, what I need to be doing. Your ODPs you can be, you define in there as well. Um, and then we have some things like uh, control records. So this is where you can track human activity. Some controls just require human activity. So who did something at some time? You got to document that and, and create a log. You can do that here. Here's your poems that you're wanting, sir. You want to look at those. Poems are in here as well. Below that is the technical stuff. So here's an example of technical indicators or searches that we've pre-built. We have hundreds of these uh, in various controls, right? All the technical controls across the 18 families. Um, and you can get these out, you'll get these out of the box and just immediately contextualize that data coming in. Um, I can jump to a, like an enhancement as well. Use some other ones. Just depending on what the control is, we've got different, different analytics you can drop in. That's your technical evidence, right? All in one place. Um, the bottom row here shows your SCAP results. So if you're doing SCAP scans, those, those will automatically be parsed to the relevant controls for you. 
um, and we'll show you the results there. And then finally, um, for you hardcore GRC folks that have to do that file stuff, we've got a table down here um, and the ability to upload any, any kind of non-technical evidence that you want. So files, documents, policies, you can upload, you can point to a repository, SharePoint, website, whatever, and it'll populate the table. So for this control, all possible types of evidence I need to assess this are here, and I can drive alert actions on all these machine data-driven analytics as well to fail that control automatically or take other actions like emailing the, the owner and so forth. Um, a couple other quick things. So there's an authorization page. I'm going to wrap this up really quickly. Authorization page at the system level. There's a Conmon dashboard. So if you want to continuously monitor a variety of technical controls, you define that in the user interface. They populate here. Uh, you click on it, ISO clicks on it, sees the evidence underneath, and boom, I just created a log for you that says you looked at this, so your auditor's gonna be happy. Um, we auto-create SSPs as well. Um, you can go to the action page, um, see all the alerts that triggered this week, um, see how many SSPs were generated, and so forth. So lots of cool, fun capabilities here. Last one I'll show you as you're trying to get to run is a coverage dashboard. So if you start with our GRC thing and just do a small instance, get your files uploaded and take care of that, uh, you want to get some data in, this dashboard shows you where you have data coming in and being mapped to controls. So you can actually lay out a roadmap to get to run by filling in the red or the yellow, getting those controls populated with data from whatever source is out there, and really get to a robust uh, you know, run, run stage of maturity. All right, so with that, Sum it up. Um, so there's three phases of maturity, right? Super complicated. Crawl, not doing a whole lot, but you still got to do the, the manual evidence. That's where Q compliance comes in. We can do that GRC stuff for you for pretty cheaply if you get a small instance. And the most important thing about that is now you've got the underlying foundation to actually get to run. If you're running a GRC that's a legacy GRC tool, you have no path of getting to run ever. You can't monitor all those technical controls in your legacy solution. So that's, I think, the biggest part of that. If you want to get to walk, there's a couple options for you. Build something yourself to monitor some controls. Do uh, SCA to monitor uh, uh, various controls. Do audit to go deep in, in audit controls or Q compliance. And then if you want to run, go with Q compliance, get all your controls taken care of, get that data in, and you're really getting uh, mature and super, super uh, strong um, security posture. Uh, I do want to mention all those require Splunk Enterprise uh, listed at the bottom there. That's the underlying you know, Splunk capability that we need for you. All right, so um, what's next? Um, I think the bar is open. No. Um, we want to, you know, if you want to figure out where you are on the curve, I had my team build a quick survey, uh, calling it a readiness assessment. It's just a couple questions online. You can take it. Um, we'll give you some free consulting to say, like, where we think you are and where, you, where we think you, we can get you very quickly, if that's of interest. Um, we hope you find that valuable. Please feel free to jump in. I'll take less than five minutes if you want to do it. Um, second thing is, Start monitoring technical controls. Like, this is cutting edge. Like, GRC, uh, Gartner didn't kill their GRC quadrant for no reason last year. It's out of date. Like, that, those solutions are legacy, and they do not get you real security value, um, for my opinion, right? So, and I think we're all in this room. If you're in this room, you're kind of on the cutting edge of that new, new paradigm, right? Doing this in a very different way on big data. So please come by our booth if you want. We're at 109. We have cool shirts we'll give you to start getting you your pilot's license, uh, instrumenting that, uh, that panel for you. Um, and we can kind of help you with crawl, walk, and run. And then finally, you know, I asked, you know, with this group, we got leaders in the room. You guys have been doing compliance probably for a while. Uh, it takes you all to make this change happen, right? We are on the cutting edge of, like, changing how compliance is done, um, getting away from relational databases, doing it in real time, making compliance actually valuable to operational security. And the more and more people we talk to, the more and more people get super excited about us. Uh, and just the possibility of doing things this way. So I hope you guys will be evangelists as well and maybe adopt this approach and start doing you know, what you do in a way that gives your organization real valuable operational security. So I uh, appreciate your time very much. Uh, thanks um, for coming in and, and listening to us for a couple minutes. Thanks, Anthony. Cool. As well. Yeah, absolutely. Great job. Yeah. I wonder, um, uh, we maybe have, it yeah. says 30 Q seconds on yeah. our clock here. Yeah. I don't know, maybe if we could take 30 seconds or, or perhaps yeah. more if they don't kick us out. Uh, for, for any of the folks here, I uh, would love to uh, request that you fill out the, the survey after you get out of here whenever you get a chance. Uh, but more importantly, while you're here together, are there questions or comments? I know we had the question on four versus five. It's an excellent question, perfectly inbounds. Any other questions or comments about what you saw today on the tech or app application, how to be successful with it? Yes, please. So, 
Sorry, go ahead. Yes, ma'am. We'll come back. Uh, I couldn't tell what was going to be on yeah. um, so, so I was down at the, the analyst compliance. I mean, I was actually looking for a form for good, and I hit your booth. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was talking about this. The, the app itself is free, but you have to hire Splunk PS. You can't, like, just download it. You've got to get Splunk PS in to help configure it. Right. Are there any of these solutions that are, like, you know, you can, because we're actually trying to build a lot of this kind of stuff ourselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it, it, it's sloppy. You just get in the app, you know, you have 500 applications, yep. getting them Absolutely. is a lot. So we're yeah. giving people negative scores, no mm -hmm. response, right? Okay. You, can't, you can't even find the data. Like, is, right. it, is it on? Is it here? Because sometimes they put the date in, you know, common solutions, and sometimes they don't. Sure. We're not going to know, necessarily, because you could have both. You could have, right. they're participating in one context, and then they're not participating in another. Yeah. So we have like a negative score if they haven't responded to the questionnaire. So that way, at least we get everybody responding to the questionnaire, right. and it's like, yeah. is it accurate, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's like, but it takes forever. Right. So to have something that's like pre-built that we can say, especially that thing that you had with the, what data is coming in for what for what stuff, it doesn't right. necessarily give you, like, you know, like with high trust, you know, they, you, they have the percentage of systems covered by yeah. the controls. So yeah. Is this in place for yeah. a system somewhere? Gotcha. The right, exactly. Makes sense. Yep. But they're giving us the red light. So let me let me yeah. be uh, respectful of the rest of the folks in the room here and say that um, the, what we showed today does require services. And most of that, frankly, is the getting data in and ensuring that the boundary is appropriate. And keep me honest, if, yep. if I'm missing anything or if you yep. have any other. Yeah, no, I'd agree. And we, you know, we can do training. We do also offer training for our solutions so we can get your own folks trained up to do that. We don't necessarily want to do all the PS in the world. Uh, we have partners as well. Right. But it, it, it rather have you self-sufficient than dependent on PS. Perfect. Really. So thank you for asking the question. I yeah. really appreciate that. Any other questions? Last one. Yeah. So we, so I, I work for, the question was uh, uh, a distinction between what I showed versus what Matt showed today. So to be clear, I'm a Splunk employee. Part of my organization is a rapid prototyping development team that built the first Splunk Clients Analytics solution that I just showed initially, Matt is CEO of a separate company that is a close Splunk partner and personal friend mm -hmm. who builds the, the amazing tech that he showed in the latter two demos uh, for today. So although we built, my dev shop built on Rev5 for the reasons I mentioned previously, uh, Matt's, I, I can't speak for Matt, but I'm sure yeah. that there's a great answer for that. Ours is Rev4. Uh, we're tracking the changes closely with NIST uh, for Rev5, um, and we typically do a, a dev cycle that's no more than six months to get Rev5 up there. You technically have a year to adopt the new version in the Fed space, um, so we, we've took that approach just to, to track the changes until they're final, and then we'll, we'll, do, we'll build them in. That's great. Great, great question. Thank you for the follow-up. Any other questions before we break? Sir, sir. Uh, so my organization has decided to bring in Q compliance and Qodit. Awesome. But has not decided to leave our other GRC behind. Mm. Okay. Is there, is there a non-crazy way to do that? Like I say. Uh, yeah, so we have a lot of customers that do that side-by-side -side thing for a while, and that's fine. We're totally fine with that. We can integrate with it, so we can feed like assessment results over typically, um, as long as they're open to sharing their APIs. And that's typically how we do it, is we'll feed. What's that? Hopefully we'll have an APL soon. Okay, yeah, yeah. So let's hear it for this guy, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. Yeah, so we'd love to talk to you about that. But we, we do integrate with DRCs uh, every now and then. Excellent. So Cool. Uh, last call. Any other questions, comments? Any reason to feed ES or UVA or Phantom into QAudit compliance? Um, we've had the request to do, uh, to basically feed QAudit and Q compliance findings out to like Phantom for orchestration. There's no reason to bring it in. I mean, we haven't done it yet. I haven't seen a use case for it, but we have done the, done the inverse, yeah. All right, anything, anything else? else? All right, thank you all so much, especially Appreciate this late in the day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.